In most cases, light, reflection, refraction, they all behave kind of how you'd expect them to, like a wave. If I shine a laser off a mirror, you can expect it to reflect somewhere else with the same angle of incidence. But there are also minor phenomena that traditionally you don't really think about that expose the craziness of light. Like why does oil produce fantastic colors when spilled on water? Or why do we see these colors on the shiny side of a CD? <laughs> oh boy, do I have news for you. Before we learn just how crazy our world is, I want to share my favorite quote from Richard Feynman in his book on quantum electrodynamics. There is this possibility, after I tell you something, you just can't believe it. You can't accept it. You don't like it. A little screen comes down and you don't listen anymore. I'm going to describe to you how nature is. And if you don't like it, that's going to get in the way of your understanding it. It's a problem that physicists have learned to deal with. They've learned to realize that whether they like a theory or they don't like a theory is not the essential question. Rather, it is whether or not the theory gives predictions that agree with experiment. When talking about predictions, quantum electrodynamics, or QED, is basically the most accurate model we have in all of physics. If you were to measure the circumference of the Earth with the accuracy of the most accurate prediction made in QED, you'd be able to accurately measure the Earth's circumference up to a width the fifth of a human hair. Mind-blowingly accurate. This accuracy is one of the main reasons why, although it hurts to accept, we have to believe what we are about to learn is the true nature of our universe. Let's begin. The first thing to accept with QED is that we can't say what will happen or why it will happen. We can only predict the probability which means you cannot make any assumptions whatsoever. Therefore, from here on forward, whenever I talk about light or a photon reflecting off a surface, I'm saying the probability is very high that it does. And thus, if you had a constant stream of light, that reflection would be very strong due to the high probability. Now let's consider our first example. We have a projector and a photon sensor over here separated by a wall. We emit one single photon at the mirror. What do we expect to happen? Intuitively, we'd say, well, the photon will bounce off the mirror here and reflect into the receptor. And that's what it appears to have done. But what if I told you the light simultaneously reflected off every portion of the mirror, and then every single reflection interacted with themselves and added up to the highly probable result that the photon would reflect off this section? <laughs> because that is what happened. A photon moves through space, constantly oscillating through its phases in a sinusoidal fashion. Each moment in time is a new phase until one full cycle completes, at which point it starts over. We can represent the current phase in time by a simple arrow that rotates at the same rate as the phase. As we imagine a photon traveling from our emitter to our receptor, it constantly cycles through its phases as time passes. This is represented as an arrow spinning. Now if we imagine that the photon indeed reflects off every surface of the mirror, then reflecting from some points will take longer to reach the receptor than others. As a result, the phase of the photon as it reaches the receptor will be different depending on its journey. You can see that for locations that take the same amount of time, they arrive with the same phase. Each arrow represents a probability amplitude for each path the photon may take. The direction of the arrow represents the phase of light that reaches the detector, and the length the probability of it doing so. Each possible path has essentially the same probability, so all our arrows have the same length. At the end of their journey, they all add together. Waves can be added together quite easily. You just take the y value of each point on one wave and add it to the y value of the other. So in phase waves double in amplitude and inverse phased waves cancel each other out. The arrows that we use to represent phase can be added together too. So if two arrows of the same phase are added together, the probability of that event occurring increases. If they are inverted, then the probability is zero. What does this mean? This means if we add all the arrows of all the paths a photon could take to the receptor, 
we will get the final expected phase and probability of that event occurring. The length of this arrow represents the probability, and the direction it points the phase that interacts with the receptor. So if we find a section on the mirror with the same phase as this arrow, we can say this section has the highest probability of reflecting the photon. Let's explore this further. When we look at the arrows of places on the mirror far from the center, we see that they start spiraling because it takes an increasingly long time for the photon to travel out to these points. As a result, it cycles through its phases a lot more. This is where quantum mechanics begins to simplify itself. As for just about every phase out here, you can find another phase that will cancel it out. This is represented by our spiral here. As we look near the center of the mirror, very few of these arrows will find a complementary arrow to cancel themselves out. So the majority of the final arrow's amplitude is composed from the arrows at the center of the mirror. Or in other words, the most probable outcome is that the photon reflects off somewhere near the center here. We can see this a little better with a live version of this model. As we move the receptor around, we can see how the phases of the different sections of mirror change and that our final probability will always closely match the phases of the center of the mirror. The incongruity at some points has to do with the numbers of arrows and that it's no longer symmetrical, so some arrows don't get completely cancelled out and thus shift the phase. If we keep it symmetrical, then we can also see that when the angle of incidence is very small, the probability or the length of our final arrow also shrinks, meaning we have a weak reflection. This is something we've all seen while looking straight down into water. There's very little reflection. However, as we increase the angle of incidence, we can see the probability of a reflection off the center of the mirror becomes very, very likely. Again, like water, we've all experienced strong reflections at large angles of incidence. Now, you should be asking, how do we know this is true? Isn't this just a fancy way to make something seem more complicated without actually accomplishing anything? And that's a great and very important question. So let's pretend light didn't behave this way. Let's say we had a really weird looking mirror that looked like this, and then we shined a white laser, which is a combination of red, green, and blue photons at this mirror. Well, then our laser should bounce off one of these little sections and reflect on our wall as a white dot. Except that's not what happens. We get basically a rainbow. This is because our new mirror creates tiny discontinuities in the surface. Remember from earlier that just about every phase has a complementary phase to cancel it out. With this new pattern, these regions, had it been a normal mirror, would have reflected a phase to cancel out another phase. But without these phases, it shifts the probability of which part of the mirror will reflect most of the light. And since red, blue, and green photons have different frequencies and thus different rates at which they cycle through phases, the section of mirror with the highest probability for reflection is different for each type of photon. Thus, you create a separation of photons into a rainbow. This is called a diffraction grating, and it's why CDs create rainbows. Tiny little grooves etched into the surface. The color we get from oil is also very similarly related to this. If we picture a cross-section of an oil slick, we see two surfaces light could reflect off. It could reflect off the top of the oil, or it could reflect off the bottom. Or, if you're paying attention, it reflects off both at the same time. Now, strangely enough, how well it reflects depends on the thickness. Let's imagine the same kind of scenario as our mirror. The photon reflects off two different points, takes two different amounts of time, and thus converges with two different phases. We then add those phase arrows together. What we find is that at certain thicknesses, these two phases cancel out and light doesn't reflect at all while at another thickness, they can add together and then it reflects with the highest probability. Remember, this doesn't mean it will reflect, but it reflects best at that thickness. So just like with the diffraction grating, red, green, and blue light all have different rates of cycling through phases, so each have a specific thickness of oil that would best suit their reflection. When we look at an oil slick, 
Minuscule variations in the thickness cause some colors to reflect more strongly than others, thus giving us that rainbow look. Lastly, let's talk about what all this means. Feynman was a big fan of simplifying complex ideas. This is why he developed his concept of probability amplitude arrows and Feynman diagrams. Why do unnecessary math when a simple representation can adequately describe what is happening? When it comes to quantum mechanics, most situations don't require that level of computation or thinking. The reason light tends to travel in straight lines and behaves the way it does is because every possible path it could take can be cancelled by another path. Except, of course, the shortest path. So in the macro world, light essentially always travels the path that takes the least amount of time. Therefore, quantum mechanics isn't really necessary. It's only when you start restricting the path light can go, like tiny narrow slits or the bounds of an atom, does the truly bizarre nature of our universe start to show itself. It's a behavior that no one can comprehend. I can't tell you why a photon will or will not reflect off a surface. Feynman couldn't, Hawkins couldn't. In fact, the math of these models dictates uncertainty. So until someone can derive a new and more accurate model of the universe, we just have to accept how bizarre it is.